Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, we've, you know, I'm sick and tired of talking about nothing but viruses because there's so much more to talk about that can, that can come and get us. So my favorite thing, of course, is there's been a big listeria myelocytogenes outbreak in the United States. Uh, this is what a gram-positive bacterium looks like. It looks like it's something from, from alien from outer space. This is actually the third leading cause of death of foodborne illnesses in the United States. About 1,600 people get sick each year, and about 250 actually die from this disease. It can be very severe in the elderly, and particularly in pregnant women. So it's a, it's a real issue. Uh, it is caused by uh, ingesting improperly treated deli meats or unpasteurized milk. <laughs> Throw in H5N1 to the unpasteurized milk things, it'll kill you. Listeria will. Uh, people get uh, infected by I ingesting this stuff, and there are two types of disease. It can be localized to your gut, which is just another one of the many uh, bacterial GI diseases we get, but unfortunately, sometimes it becomes invasive. And when it's invasive, it gets into the bloodstream. It causes very serious illness. People get um, uh, stiff neck, confusion, uh, sometimes convulsions. So it's a really very, very serious disease. In pregnant women, it can cause uh, miscarriages and stillbirths. And who's responsible? <laughs> Boar's head. <laughs> now, now, I feel bad for these people. They're in Virginia. They've already had to recall a bunch of stuff, but now they've had recalled 7 million pounds of deli meats. I, I can't, that's probably enough for my family in a, two weekends. But uh, they, they've said if it uh, expires through October 24th, October, I'm sorry, October 17th, 2024, it could be contaminated. So everybody go in your refrigerators, look for any uh, meats that you have that are from Boar's Head uh, that still are, you know, not beyond their expiration date and throw it out. Now, how did they find this? Maryland Department of Health actually did a sample from liverwurst. That's where the positive sample was from. They sequenced it and they found it. There is a list here I've included that you can go to the full product list and one of the products, by the way, that has been contaminated is Boar's Head Head Cheese. Now, <laughs> I know the Pennsylvania Dutch are big on it, but oh my God, make your own or something. It's just Boar's Head Head Cheese is not on my, on my list. Well, let's talk about COVID because everybody seems to have COVID these days. I was in my elevator today. Guy walked out with his mask, said hello. He said, I look at him, well, he said second week. And, and then he also said Paxlovid was a great drug. This is a young guy. so. A lot of people showing up sick. Now, there's a change in that's a little interesting. This is visits to the emergency room, and th this is the usual peak we've seen in 75 and 65-year-olds. But notice there are two other groups, under the age of 1 and 12 to 15-year-olds, showing up a lot in emergency rooms with COVID. If you need another reason to get your kid vaccinated, that's one of them. Now, hospitalization is still mainly over the age of 65. So that's good, but if you look at what's going on in the wastewater, it's still rising. I, my guess is it will peak to the same level as Jan was, was last year. And it's not particularly localized, it's all over the United States. So again, I mentioned this, this is acting more like waning immunity from either previous infection or vaccine and changing in the virus, so now everyone is sort of susceptible to it. So get a vaccine. I got my vaccine, by the way, last week. And if you think it's not coming to a place near you, two-thirds of the schools in Houston, in the public school district, are positive for COVID. So you can pretty much guarantee that anywhere you are in the United States, if you're sending a kid to school, he's going to be exposed to COVID. He or she will be exposed to COVID. So the best way to take care of that, get your kid vaccinated. And the vaccines are out. The new vaccines are out. I'm going to talk about that in just a, just a second. Uh, what's going on in the, in the evolution of the virus? Right now, uh, the main strain is KP3. Now that is this uh, aqua color. KP3 is the dominant strain. And I'm gonna show you a complicated diagram, but this is really very insightful. Remember, 2022, Omicron came from South Africa. It was a lot of changes, 25 mutations, became the dominant strain in 22. And then this is interesting, in 2023, I've mentioned this many times, there was a strain that developed in Denmark, BA 2.86. Similar to Omicron, had many, many mutations, over 30 mutations, but it didn't become the dominant strain worldwide until it acquired one more mutation, and that became JN1. And JN1 was the dominant strain last year. 
Last year's vaccine was the XBB 1.5 down here, similar but not exactly matched. This year, this in, what's available right now through Moderna and Pfizer is the KP2 vaccine. So that's what I got, KP2. KP3 is the dominant strain, so it's closely related and should be a match. What's interesting, just like with BA 2.86, there is a new variant, XEC. It is a recombination of, a, of two very small, two lesser variants, KS1 and KP3. Came from Germany and Denmark. I don't know what those Denmark people are doing, but they keep creating new strains. Because it's a recombinant, it's a concern that it, like BA 2.86, it might spread all, all over the world. Right now, it's just 1% of, uh, of the strains in the United States, so it's not even on the variant uh, things that we follow in the U.S., but it will, the concern is it will become dominant. I think it'll probably be like 2.86. It's a recombinant that begins to spread. It'll probably undergo mutations to become more and more infectious. So we'll keep an eye on that. It's closely related to the KP2 vaccine. So if you get your vaccine, and I'm going to say, get your vaccine, you should be protected against all these flirt variants, as they're called. Now, there are a bunch of studies. I'm going to summarize them all in one sentence. Uh, Long-term prognosis of patients with myocarditis. Remember, there was uh, a concern that if you get vaccinated, young boys got, uh, had a rare finding, occasionally got myocarditis. Large French national study looking at many, many kids who got vaccinated. They, of the kids that got myocarditis, it was very mild, much less than serious other forms of myocarditis, so not a real concern. Nature article looking at mucosal delivery of uh, vaccine. We've talked a lot about when you get an IM injection, which these are, it creates uh, antibodies, IgG and IgM, that are very good at protecting you from system, systemic circulation. Doesn't prevent entry of the virus through the nasal mucosa or any of the other mucosal uh, uh, surfaces. So that's why we've talked about nasal vaccines. Well, this was a study looking at a different way to deliver the vaccine, an adenovirus, which produced a very good mucosal response. So that's a potential new way uh, to, to, to deliver uh, uh, the immunogen later uh, down the road. And then another study, 1.7 million Singaporeans found they were looking at the uh, autoimmune uh, complications of getting COVID. Uh, a lot of times people get arthritis or other auto autoimmune type diseases, uh, heart disease, lung disease. What they showed was vastly reduced with vaccination. So one more example why you should get vaccinated. Uh, right now, in I, even though I got my flu vaccine a little early, it's not really flu season. So if you look at right now, influenza and RSV is very low. And so, you know, you can wait for another four to six weeks when flu season really picks up. I just wanted to get it over so I got my flu vaccine. The TEFI data, real interesting. You can see spikes. These are not really changed. Echo and enterovirus. A lot of people who have colds. I had got a recent cold <laughs> playing with my grandchild. Almost certainly was enterovirus. You know, you get a little queasy stomach, and then next thing you have a full-blown uh, upper respiratory infection. That's probably enterovirus. Mpox, still around. We, I promised I would talk about Mpox this week, but I lied. Too much. <laughs> we need to spend more time on it, so we'll spend some time some, maybe next week. Parvo still around, and SARS just, look at that, huge spike in SARS-CoV-2. But my sister called me, like, she saw, read an article in the New York Times about this weird thing called Oropucha virus. She goes, of course, this is a classic thing. Sunday afternoon, we get a call from my sister. What about Oropucha virus? What's that? Well, this is interesting. The CDC is following this. This is uh, spread by uh, bites from a midge. And I'll show you a picture of a midge. A midge is like the nastiest little thing. It's like if you crossed a fly with a mosquito, <laughs> you'd end up with a midge. And they're really nasty. This is a, a, a virus that is uh, mostly in Central America and South America. Symptoms that are a lot like Zika or Dengue or many of these viruses. Fever, headaches, chills. Uh, best way to protect yourself, of course, is to not get bitten. And uh, there were, uh, before 2000, all the outbreaks were in Central America. In the last 25 years, they've been in Brazil, Bolivia, Colombia. But why, is it a, why are we talking about it? In June of this year, the first cases were reported in Cuba. And so this, the reason it's called Oropuche virus is it was isolated in 1955 from a 24-year-old forest worker who was working in Vega de Oropuche in the Trinidad. Uh, it's often called sloth fever because the females, when they lay their eggs, have to provide a blood meal. And so one of the, the, the animals that it feeds on, besides the occasional human, 
is sloths, and so it's called sloth fever. So far, and the reason why the CDC has been following this and why it's in the New York Times, is there have been 32 cases in the United States, mostly in Florida, another reason why you should never go to Florida, and then Kentucky and New York. All of these are related to travel to Cuba. So if you want to uh, have nightmares at night, look at this thing. This is a midge. Looks like a cross between a fly and a mosquito, and it's little tiny. Sometimes people talk, you know, talk about sand fleas and things like that, because these are bites. You can't even see these things usually. Uh, and we're not the intended uh, uh, target, but if you're around and it's infected, it can infect you. Lastly, I, want, I did mention uh, monkeypox. I wanted to talk a little bit more about that later, but frankly, it just popped up. Iowa, a correctional facility identified a patient with uh, mpox. This is the same variety that was in 2022. It's called clade two. It's not the most serious mpox. The real serious one is clade one from Central uh, Africa. That's the one that WHO is all concerned about because there have been hundreds of deaths from that disease. Uh, there have been none reported in Iowa before, and so it's a little bit of a surprise, but we seem to have mpox clade one, which is sort of left over from 2022. There's not been a reported case of clade one in the US, but the World Health Organization and the CDC is very concerned. Anyway, so I want to end up today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, Big kudos to us and the University of Houston. We received a $44 million uh, Clinical Translational Science Award called CTSA. This is a highly competitive award, and it really is there to build infrastructure for clinical trials. Uh, we joined up with the University of Houston uh, to uh, submit our application, and a giant shout out to Dr. Chris Amos and Fasia Conwell at Baylor and Dr. Betting Beach of University of Houston. So really important for building clinical trials infrastructure. Also, I want to co congratulate Dr. Marietta de Guzman, Professor of Pediatrics and Rheumatology, who has been selected by the American Academy of Pediatrics as the winner of the James T. Cassidy Award. This is an award for honors the pediatric rheumatologists who have made uh, significant contributions to the field. And finally, today, Happy Friday! Happy Friday! Happy Friday! Happy Friday! Happy Friday! Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. A giant shout out to everyone who's purchased our new Happy Friday t shirts. Uh, this, a portion of each sale goes to support uh, the GRAB, which is called our food pantry. You know, today students uh, and their families have a lot of problems with uh, food insecurity. And so one of the ways we deal with that is we provide free food in, a, in what we call GRAB. And it requires a certain amount of support from our community. But this year, right now, and now for just a completely um, transparent sales pitch, we have these t-shirts, which are after our video each week called Happy Friday t-shirts. So it has Baylor College of Medicine and Happy Friday. These are available for purchase. Uh, there are millions of these available. Feel free to order many for your friends and colleagues and it'll all go to support the uh, Grab Pantry. Anyway, have a wonderful uh, weekend and I can't wait to see you next week.